Greetings, dear friends. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for the privilege to be able to worship together. We want to thank God for affording us another week and for affording us another privilege to know that we can still call him our father and friend and know that he has our best interests. What a privilege it is to be able to still be alive and be able to see a new week. And I trust that wherever you are joining from today, you have been experiencing that comforting, upholding, and truly love-filled presence. Thank you once again, friends, for taking the time to join us. Thank you for your support and prayers. I want to praise God, for he is worthy of our praise. It is not just what he's been doing for us. It is who he is. And he deserves all our praise. When there's food on the table or not, God deserves to be praised. God remains good. Whether there's a cloth on the body or not, God deserves to be praised. He remains good. And so, friend, whatever life's challenge, struggle, turmoil, or crisis you may be going through, I pray, dear friend, I pray that the God who's been with you in those joyous times may not change in your heart, for that God has not changed. The Bible says, I am always the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same, friends. And so I pray that if you trust that he was there and saw you through all those previous struggles and storms, Trust dear friend, as Samuel did, that hitherto the Lord has led us. Thus far, the Lord has led us. And the one who knows how to bring us thus far is more than able to take us ahead also. And so I trust, friend, that you will look to him and not to the deluge of evil and conspiracy that, that surrounds you. I pray that your eyes may be fixed upon Jesus, the one who is truly able to see you through. I'd like to invite you, friends, to join me in prayer as we go into today's study. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What a privilege it is. What a blessing it is. What an honor it is to know that we can still kneel in your presence and that with joy you take us in. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to know that we can still study your word. That, Lord God, you will still allow us to learn and appreciate, to study and to grow, because soon, soon, mighty God, the Bible says he will not be found. And so we are to come to him while he is still near. So help us, God, as we come to you. Help us to seek your face. Help us to love you and serve you. We thank you. We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit today. Speak to us, Lord. Stir us to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us. And I trust that God has been speaking to you and giving you hope uh, even in the midst of the hopelessness that surrounds us. Our subject for appreciation today is entitled A Strange Act. A Strange Act. We're going to turn our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, we've been seeing and just experiencing the mighty, mighty things God has prepared for his people, especially in the time of the end. We have seen how in the midst of a crisis, while people can, can get too caught up talking about the coming crisis, Isaiah's focus is on knowing the God who is above the crisis, the God who is able to see his people through the crisis. Now, friends, it is important to understand that very precious concept. It is very important to understand that very, very precious concept. Turn with me 
in your Bibles to the book of Psalm 119. And notice, notice what the psalmist says. Very, very important words. Psalm 119, really powerful, just powerful. Psalm 119 and verse 50. Notice this passage with me, friends. What a, what a powerful truth. Psalm 119, verse 50. The Bible says, the psalmist speaking, he says, this is my comfort in my affliction. Hmm. Let's look at verse 49 to catch a little bit more of a context. Psalm 119, verse 49, the Bible says, Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Oh, Lord, remember your word, the word you've given us. And then he says in verse 50, this word, this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Thy word hath given me life. Thy word has raised me up. Listen to what the text is saying, friends. The psalmist is saying, Lord, your word is my comfort in my affliction. Now that's powerful. Did you notice, friends, the psalmist is not saying that thy word has caused me to escape the affliction. No, no, no. Friends, the Bible says God's word is a comfort in the midst of the affliction. Friends, I hope we really catch that very, very precious concept. Hmm. Hmm. This is, this is important. This is important. Come with me to Job chapter 6 and verse 10. This is an important thought to appreciate. Hmm. Job chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Then should I yet have comfort, then should I yet have comfort, yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Yeah, I would harden myself in sorrow. Friends, has the sorrow of life hardened you? Or have you learned to find comfort in the words of the Lord? Look with me in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Notice what Paul says in Romans 15, 4 about the word of God. He says, for whatsoever things were written, Romans 15 verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Brothers and sisters, what, whatever was written in God's word was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Isn't that powerful that scriptures were written for, to create in us a, a, an experience of learning, to birth in us an experience of patience, to deliver in our lives, dear friends, a comfort so that we may have hope. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, in the midst of my affliction, says the psalmist, is the comfort of God's word. You see, friends, has the time of this crisis and affliction, has it been a time of brokenness, destitution, or has it been a time of learning? Has the, has the impatience around you, surrounding you, created only patience in you as you look to God's word? Has the discomfort in the lives around you only brought comfort in your life as you receive the comfort of God's word? Does the hopelessness around you only create in your heart a burning desire to stay with the God of hope, the God of all comfort. What powerful words, friends, what powerful words. And it's interesting, friends, we're, we're, we're looking in the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah has much to say to us, and he'd, he'd like us to really, he'd like us to really pay attention, because Friends, the, the, name, the, the name Isaiah itself literally means Yahweh has saved. 
isn't that powerful? I, I, I don't know, friends, if you've, if you've been with us on, on our journey since this past week, we've looked at many powerful truths in the book of Isaiah. And while stark judgments are pronounced upon the people of the land, isn't it powerful that the, the, really the message, the core of the book of Isaiah is that Jehovah has the power to save. God has the power to save. In other words, friends, the salvation of God is greater than any destruction that may be upon you. While I'm speaking to someone, friend, who is feeling dark and destitute and, and broken and, and just without any hope, God is saying that the salvation and comfort of God is greater than the utter desolation and barrenness that surrounds you, dear friend. The promise of God is that you can come to him and that in his presence, you will find a comfort that passes all human understanding, all universal understanding. The world in its entirety, the, the universe cannot put in words. Friends, eternal, endless ages, and if every, if every man was a scribe and every stock, as the songwriter says, would be a quill, would be a pen. And if you wrote and wrote and wrote, if every drop in the ocean was ink and the heavens were the parchment, it would not be enough, friends. It would just not be enough to write about the God who is love. Write about the God who is love. Oh, the Bible is precious. The Bible is just precious. We thank God for his words, friends. And he says that in the midst of darkness, the light of God's word seeks to bring comfort to your heart. And so, dear friend, my appeal to you is to run to God's word and find the comfort the world just cannot give. The world just does not understand. Our subject today, friends, is entitled A Strange Act. We're back in the book of Isaiah. We're looking at that pattern. But friends, what's amazing about it is that with each pattern, while, the, while it seems like it's the same story, with each pattern, God has been trying to teach us some precious truths. And I, and I hope, dear friends, that you've been learning those precious truths. Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 6 were similar, but Isaiah 6 emphasized in, in a beautiful way that unless we come that close to God, we will not see how far short we have fallen. We will not realize how much we need the Lord. We, we will not realize how depraved we are in our spiritual existence unless we come that close to God. We study together, friends, that if we do not come that close to God, we will never know who we really are. It was when Isaiah stood that close to God, face to face with God, that he was able to see who he really is and cried out, woe is unto me. Woe is unto me. Notice, friends, tying in with those words are the first words of Isaiah 28 and verse 1, as the Bible says, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Notice, friends, the Bible speaks of a time about a people who are drunkards, a people who wear the crown of pride, who take pride in their glorious beauty, but their beauty is a fading flower. And friends, we're told these are those who are drunk and overcome with wine overcome with wine. Now, friends, if you are familiar with your Bibles, do you know a time in history when the people of the world are going to be drunk as they are getting drunk right now? Do you know the time when that is soon upon us, when people will become more and more drunk with wine? The Bible speaks about that time in Revelation 14 and verse 8, speaking about that false system of worship, that false church that stands in opposition to the true church of God. 
it is described as Babylon and all the sister churches that come together and all false systems of worship that join together in the experience of Babylon, the word that means confusion. That great city, oh, we see the city of glorious beauty. She had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's interesting. The falsehood of Babylon has made the world's drunk. If you still remember our story of the high cost of inheritance, when we were looking at that false woman, that harlot woman, as described in Revelation 17, also as that harlot church, a type of that harlot church. And friends, we, 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 we study how from this harlot comes forth the wine, the falsehood. You remember how Jezebel in her falsehood made the people, the judges, even the people of the land drunk with her falsehood. Her false piety, her false spirituality made the people think that the innocent law keeper Naboth was really the problem and needed to be killed. And the man actually had to pay for what he stood for with his own life. He paid the high cost of inheritance. Friends, the Bible speaks about a time that is soon going to be upon us as we are quickly nearing there as the world more and more gets drunk under the influence of that false system of worship. And we read, friends, that the Bible describes this entity as Babylon and it is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The Bible continues in Isaiah 28 and verse two, a people drunk with wine, a people covered with that crown of pride. Isaiah 28 verse two tells us, behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. What do we have? We have the classic example of what we've been looking at thus far. Notice what we continue to read. We read that the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden underfoot. We are told that, friends, those who get drunk by the falsehood of the world, instead of being covered and overtaken by the comfort of God's word, are going to be a people who are going to be trodden under the foot of judgment. Now, friends, again, I, I, I pray that you do not lose sight of the the grander narrative that is revealed to us that we've been covering and looking at in the in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We looked at from the passage in Matthew 6, the prayer often known as the Lord's Prayer. We're back in Isaiah 28 and we're told that the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, there shall be trodden underfoot. And then we read, we read that while a people will be overcome with wine, destruction is going to be upon the land. You would remember as Sodom was drunk with, with its own falsehood and evil, destruction came upon it. We're going to see again as sinfulness increases in the extreme, God's judgments will be upon the land. And describing around that time, we find something else taking place. And this is where it just gets beautiful. While there's destruction upon the land, notice what the Bible says in verse five, when the Bible says, in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory, for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. <laughs> I've looked at this passage perhaps a few times and it still puts a smile on my face how God manages to do this. I mean, it's amazing how God unmistakably leaves that footprint for us to see, hey, there it is. Don't miss it. Don't miss it that while there's going to be destruction upon the land, the people of the Lord, the people of the Lord, in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory. The people of the Lord will be 
crowned with God's glory, lightening the world with God's glory. God will be upon his people as a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Oh, unto the remnant of his people. You still remember in Isaiah chapter one, unless the Lord had left a remnant with us, we would have been like Sodom. What a powerful truth, friends. What a powerful truth. And friends, it is, the, it is the thing that God would like his people to be. A people who become a beacon of hope. A people who become light in the midst of darkness. A people who become the source of comfort because they point people to that ultimate source of comfort, the God of all comfort, Christ our Savior. It's just powerful to me how God manages to put all of this repeatedly in scripture to make sure God's people are not left without hope in any season of life. At any era of, of human history, God's people have always had a word to fall upon, a promise to claim, a word to cling on to and receive comfort in your affliction, dear friends, in your affliction. Notice what the Bible continues to say in Isaiah Chapter 28, verse 5, we see that while destruction is upon the land, God's glory is covering the earth as he becomes a crown of glory for his people. We find in Isaiah 28 and verse 7, the Bible says, but they also have erred. Now notice, speaking about God's people, there are those in the midst of God's people who the Bible says who have also erred through wine. In other words, they have become intoxicated by the falsehood of the world and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Is God speaking to somebody today, friends? Is God speaking to somebody today plainly and clearly, dear friend? Is God trying to reach out to you today by saying, I see, dear child, that you have drunk yourself out of the way? Now, what's amazing about this text is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, so what's amazing is that the falsehood of the world takes you out of the way, takes you out of Jesus. What hurts God is when even priests and prophets err through allowing the falsehood, the merriment of the world, the drunkenness of the cares of the world take God's people away from his presence. And friends, I'm not talking about those high fashion labeled sins that always get talked about. I am speaking of anything, dear friend, today. Listen to me very carefully. Anything that has erred you out of the work that God wants you to do. They also have erred. They have erred through wine, through strong drink. They are out of the way. God is speaking to his people. He says in verse 8, For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a stirring a statement for God to make. All tables are full of vomit and filthiness. You would remember when we were studying the sanctuary, God had instructed Moses to put the table and to put all that is upon the table in order. It was the table of showbread and all that was going to go on it was going to, was supposed to be in order. We found that it was the table of showbread. Bread was that prime thing that went on it. And if bread represented the word of God in, a, in Exodus 40, when God asks Moses and instructs him to put the things of the table in order on the table, it was the responsibility of the priests every Sabbath to come and put the bread, bread put fresh bread in order. And friends, we, we took the appeal from uh, Exodus 40 that was appealing unto us to get our tables in order. But friends, the question of the Lord is, 
It says, is your table filled with God's word or is your table filled with vomit and filthiness of this world? So that there is no place clean. There is no place clean for the word because it's so tainted. It is so marred. It is, it is, it is so stained by the darkness and the filth of this world. In the midst of such degradation, in the midst of such wretchedness, the word of the Lord is a question. God asks a question. In the midst of such mayhem, God raises a question in verse 9. The question is, whom shall he teach knowledge? You see, friends, as, as Isaiah speaks to a backslidden, downtrodden people who are out of the way, who are out of the Lord, he is asking the question, he's saying, whom is God going to share his knowledge with? Whom, who, to whom can God explain to me, if everywhere is filth and dirt and knowledge, who will God teach? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts? Listen to this. Listen to this, friends. Whom shall he teach knowledge? To whom shall he make to understand doctrine? The answer says, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. This is interesting. Who are those who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts? To whom shall I teach knowledge if the priests and the prophets are going astray? If the great men of society have walked away from me, who am I going to teach the deep things about myself? God says, well, I am going to go to the ones who are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. Lord, who are they? They are the babies of society. They are the babes of society. Jesus speaks about them in Matthew 21 and verse 16. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never heard out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? If the grown-ups have no time for me, it is out of the mouth of children. Friends, it's out of the mouth of the meek and lowly that God is going to perfect his praise. You see, dear friend, my question to you is, are you willing to humble yourself before the Lord? Perhaps you're someone who has just come to the truth. Perhaps you're someone who has just embraced the truth of Christ. Jesus is looking to perfect praise from your lips and from your life today, dear friend. It doesn't matter how little you know about God. It doesn't matter how little you know from God's word. The reality is, friends, God can teach you in a day. God can teach you in a moment what the great men of this world just cannot. It's the truth, friends. It's the truth. God can teach you in a moment what the great men may have taken decades to learn. God can teach you and teach you far beyond. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Friends, if you're willing to be, as Jesus said, like that child, you're ready to inherit heaven. If you're willing to be like that child, the child who's willing to be guided, the child who's willing to be molded and fashioned into the likeness of that great heavenly parent. In Matthew 11 and verse 25, the Bible says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou has hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Isn't it amazing, friends? It strikes me when I come across a certain passage and, and immediately uh, the Lord reveals another passage that connects with it. I'm like, Lord, wait, 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 wait. Like, I, I'm thinking that. And I'm like, Lord, like, Lord, wait, what? I, I, I don't deserve that. I, I, I don't deserve that connection. Why? I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a connection. I'm just looking at that text when, when it's almost as someone's speaking into your ear. Oh, you remember that text? And allows you to see a connection, allows you to see a bridge between the two. And friends, we're, we're, it's, just, it's just amazing. And the Lord is saying, friends, 
that the things that are hid from the from the so-called wise and prudent of the land, God is going to reveal it to babes, to those who are those humble children who long to understand the Lord better, who long to share more of Jesus, who, who long to be in his presence and who long to tell the world about this wonderful Savior. And so, dear friend, do not look down on your humble experience. Perhaps it's just been a few days or a few years Perhaps it's just been a few months since you've come to know Jesus. My appeal to you, friends, is that stay with Jesus. The reality is, friends, your humble experience, as short, as brief as that experience has been, the reality is your own personal humble experience with the Lord is of far greater value than what you read about the great patriarchs and prophets in the Word of God. Because it's your personal. It's good to read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but friends, none of their experiences match yours. You know why? Because yours is yours. No one else has no one else has the say on it because it's it's between you and the Lord. It's personal. And there will be times, friends, when you will go out to share the good news of Jesus with others, and the question that will be faced with is, brother, now I hear about this Abraham. I hear about this Jacob, but if you're so convinced about this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then tell me what has he done for you? What's your personal experience? And the reality is, friends, he who's not had a personal experience with the Lord really has nothing to give to the world. You can quote many Bible texts. You can quote great scholars and the learned men of this world. But friends, if you've not had a personal experience with the Lord, you have nothing to impart to the world. So the Bible says to us in Matthew 11, verse 25, God is looking for those who are willing to be babes. You see, dear friends, I think we need to understand that unless there is that childlikeness within. I did not say childishness. I said childlikeness, the innocence, the purity, the willingness to be molded and guided. Friends, if we come with our preconceived opinions and notions, God cannot, cannot work with pride and stubbornness and hardened natures. If we truly would like to be led and inspired by the Lord, if we truly like to understand the deep things about God, friends, it will take humility on our part to come as babes to him, as, as, as the Bible tells us, friends, in, in, in 2 Corinthians verse 8, I believe it is, or rather chapter 8 in 2 Corinthians, rather 1 Corinthians, I think it is. Yes, it is 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Paul says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet at, as he ought to know. Paul says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So friends, if you're thinking, perhaps you know too much, I think what you need is a humbling experience before the Lord. Kneel before him and come to that word again saying, Lord, teach me, teach me. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. I hope, friends, you don't just sing that hymn. I hope you really mean that hymn in your heart. Fill us up, Lord, and make us whole. The Bible continues in Isaiah 28 and verse 12 when the Bible says to him to whom he said, this is the rest. This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. You see, friends, the Bible says, in Isaiah 28 and verse 12, God's appeal to the world, God's appeal to those who were the wise and prudent, to those who were the learned of society, God's trying to give them the rest, but they're rejecting the rest. They're weary, they're tired, God's trying to give them rest, but they are rejecting the true rest that comes from the Lord. Jesus says, all those who are weary, come to me. I will give you the rest because Jesus is the rest. Friends, you see, we can't uh, say, Lord, give me rest and be unwilling to come to the Lord himself. 
He says, I've been, I've been wanting to give you the rest, but you have been rejecting. You would not hear. You see, friends, destruction is upon the land. And now he's taken in Isaiah 28, a specific appeal is being given as, as, the, as the people of God are shaken. A specific appeal is, 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 is being given. They are realizing, what are we doing? Look, all this while God had begun giving the rest and we've been rejecting the rest of the Lord. Friends, notice uh, 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 the text also says, this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. You see, friends, what a sad experience it will be that in the time of the refreshing, which we've studied, is the time of the latter rain. In that time of the refreshing, which we read in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, in the time of the latter rain, when God promises to blot out all sin, in the time of the latter rain, God, God is saying, look at this people so drunk with the world so drunk with the falsehood of this world, I give them my spirit, and yet they would not hear. Yet they do not care for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, I hope that that may never be our story. I hope that that may never be said about you, that I'm giving this child my rest, but the child just wouldn't accept my rest. I'm giving this child of mine, I'm giving this home the peace that comes from the Lord, but they just wouldn't accept. Friends, is the Lord trying to give you the rest from your burdens, the burdens of your sin, the burdens of your tragedies, the burdens of your dark past, the burdens of your failing marriage, the burdens of your wayward home? God is wanting to give you rest. Please do not reject the Lord. As he gives the refreshing, please do not turn away from the Lord. The Bible continues in Isaiah 28 and verse 15. The Bible says, because ye have said we have made a covenant with death. And with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. What a terrible time, friends, when people, God's people, begin to take refuge in lies. When falsehood becomes the, the covering of God's people. And friends, we're seeing in society today how under the, under the, under the, the false canopy, the failing and crumbling canopy of sin, people are trying to find refuge. Under this, this false shield, people think they are protected. And friends, it's disturbing when people of influence speak lies and the masses accept the lies, claiming them to be truth to themselves. Under falsehood, some people say they have found a refuge. Now, friends, this is where it gets beautiful. See, Isaiah 28 is really powerful. It is speaking about the time of the judgment, but it is also such a powerful, such a heartfelt appeal from the Lord to his people. And now notice this, even when the people are saying, it's fine, we've made an agreement with hell. I think that's pretty serious. We've made a covenant with death. I think this is pretty much the time when God should cut everything off from them. And yet, friends, in the most marvelous fashion, God turns to them and says this, don't miss this, don't miss this. In one breath, as the people say, we've made a covenant with death, an agreement with hell. The Lord comes back with a response and says, this is what the Lord says. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Oh, isn't that beautiful, friends? Isn't that heartwarming? When the world has made its refuge, when they've made their bed in hell, even in those moments, the Lord has this powerful comeback. And see, the comeback is awesome. The comeback is awesome. I'll tell you why. The comeback is awesome because the Lord says, the attack, 
the counter that I have to hell, the comeback that I have for evil and falsehood, the punchline against darkness, God says is, a found, is the foundation, a stone. God says my attack on falsehood is that there is a precious cornerstone. My attack on evil is that I have a sure foundation. Lord, what are you talking about? If you come with me to Psalm 118, the psalmist speaks about the similar thought. In Psalm 118 and verse 22, notice what the psalmist says. This is beautiful. Psalm 118 verse 22, the psalmist says, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. That's interesting. The stones which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Jesus picks up those same, that same text in Matthew 21, verse 42. And notice what Jesus says. Speaking about himself, notice what he says. Matthew 21, verse 42. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus says unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, it's powerful. It is powerful, friends. Mm. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 11, Acts chapter 4 verse 11, the Bible says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Friends, uh, so just so that we have no other doubts, Paul clears it for us who this is in Ephesians 2 and verse 20. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, and we are and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This is beautiful, friends. Listen to me. Even as people stood out of the way, even as people stood there in drunkenness, even as people stood there saying with, with hell and with death, we've made a covenant and an agreement. Even as they had turned their backs and said, we want nothing to do with you, God. Falsehood is our refuge. God appeals to them, no, 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 children. You need a better foundation. You need a better stone. You need the precious cornerstone. I'm going to save you. This outwardness that you're feeling, this waywardness that is in your life, I'm going to fix this through the foundation stone, Jesus Christ. Oh, it's beautiful, friends. Oh, Isaiah 28 is beautiful. Don't you just admire, don't you, isn't your heart just overwhelmed, friends, with the peace of God, with the love of God, that even in the midst of utter wickedness, the Lord says, I have a plan. I really have a plan. The Lord says, I, 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 I'm going to do something. And what I am going to do is that I am going to give them Jesus. That's who they need. Jesus is their need. Jesus is going to solve the problem. He is the tried stone. He's the foundation. He's the stone. He's the cornerstone. He's the sure foundation. All those who believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, this is powerful. This is really powerful, friends, that the Lord is giving us hope, that the Lord is giving us an assurance that we, in the midst of our darkness, in your darkness, in your barrenness today, friends, in your waywardness today, there is hope because of the sure foundation, Jesus Christ. Let's continue as we begin to close and speak about that strange act. Listen to this. Isaiah 28 is quite a revelation, friends. The Bible says, judgment also will I lay to the lion, righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Oh, it's beautiful. God says, my judgment is going to be upon the lion. 
Righteousness upon the plummet they hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. The water will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death shall be annulled. Your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. You will be trodden down by it. He's saying to his children, no, that's a false refuge. Don't let the devil tell you that in falsehood there is safety. No, friends, as comfortable as it may be, as high as the, as, the, as, the, as the riches may be, do not give in to the falsehood. Do not give in to the error of what this falsehood brings. Just do not give in to it, friend. Just do not give in to it. Just today, saw in the news a story about a man named Ramon Abbas. And Ramon Abbas, was the man who flaunted a lavish lifestyle of private jets and designer clothes and luxury cars. He had 2.5 million followers on Instagram. And uh, th th this man who boarded helicopters uh, from, his, from his Dubai waterfront apartment, he walked around with shopping bags uh, from Gucci and Versace and Fendi on, on, on social media, he'd post videos of himself just, you know, throwing around cash like confetti. Uh, this is what the news is, is, is saying about him. But then a federal affidavit alleged that his extravagant lifestyle was actually financed through hacking schemes uh, that stole millions of dollars from major companies in the United States and Europe. They found out that this is all the result of lies, of falsehood. And it's just, just, just disturbing, just disturbing. And it was just last month when UAE investigators swooped into his, his Dubai apartment. They arrested him, handed him over to the FBI, who flew him to Chicago on July 2. And friends, oh, if you, if you see him standing there, oh, the man who, who lived in that, in that exclusive Palazzo Versace in Dubai. I think that's, that's, not a, that's, not a, that's not a cheap place just by the name of the designer, I guess, who's designed it. And he, the news report says that, that, that all of this was being led, a global network that used computer intrusions, business email compromise schemes, money laundering to steal hundreds of millions of dollars from companies, federal prosecutors have alleged this against him. And when this man was arrested, friends, along with 11 others, investigators seized $41 million. They seized $41 million. They also seized 13 luxury cars, which, uh, which totaled to $6.8 million. That's just, that's just terrible. He's living all, he's living this great fancy life. On his birthday, he, I think, yes, it was his birthday. When he, when he's speaking about it, yes, he's, 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 he's speaking and posting on Instagram. This post, he says, you know, I started out my day having sushi down at Nobu in Monte Carlo, Monaco, then decided to take a helicopter to have facials at the Christian Dior spa in Paris, then ended my day having champagne in Gucci. This, this, this is what he's saying. Look, look, at, look at what he's flaunting. Look at what his, what his refuge was in standing around displaying multiple models of, of, of expensive cars. He's, he's, he's trying there with a, he's posting all of this with a hashtag, all mine, all mine. And today, friends, the, the man who posted with big stars, the man who, who claimed that all of this is his, revealed that all of this was his by fraud, by evil. God is saying, your covenant with death will not stand. Your agreement with hell will not work. The overflowing scourge shall pass through. Friends, whatever you're taking refuge in, it will not stand. The millions of dollars, the great fancy apartments, private jets, the luxuries, nothing will be able to stand. It'll all be trodden down. It will all be destroyed, dear friend. Nothing will be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. 
I think we'll be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. And then we read in verse 21, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valleys of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work. Bring to pass his act, his strange act. What? <laughs> so we read in, in verse 18 that God's judgments, God's judgments will be upon the land. The overflowing scourge shall pass through and, 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 and the unbelieving, those who are hardening their hearts and rejecting Jesus. Jesus was the attack against the falsehood, the sure foundation. But if you reject Jesus, he is the life. The, li the world is death. Jesus is the life. And if you reject him, judgment is upon and I want to say it again, friends, as we, as we, as we said in, in, in one of the previous presentations, that, that, that God is not waiting to overflow you with judgment. Rather, he is standing to protect you from the judgment that you have bound yourself to. The wages of sin is death. You've bound yourself to death. And he's standing in between. He's standing on that highway to hell saying, come out of this way. He's offering you the sure foundation of Jesus saying, get out of this way. Because that day, friends, as he comes in judgment, God will stand wroth in the valley of Gibeon and he will do his work. But the Bible says the work he is about to do, the judgment that he brings upon the land is a strange work. It is a strange act. Now, friends, I, I don't know if you realize what the Bible just said. What the Bible has just declared, friends, is that punishment, punishment to our merciful God is a strange act. Judgment, the judgment of destruction to our merciful Loving Savior is a strange act. Oh, friends, this is, this is too much. This is too much. We reject him. We turn our backs upon him. We make a covenant with death and we make an agreement with hell. And yet, as we trample him underfoot, as we kick dirt rather in his face, he says... He says, I, it, it is not in pleasure that destruction comes. In fact, it is a strange act for me. To bring punishment, to bring the judgment of destruction is a strange thing even for God to do. Do you get this or not, friends? Does this stir your heart to realize that the God of the Old Testament, who people say is the angry God who wants to kill everyone, is the same God who's saying, this is a strange act for me. Judgment is a strange act for me. The judgment rather of destruction is a strange act for me. Oh, this is, this is deep, friends. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, be not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Be not mockers, friend. Don't reject God's mercies, lest the bands of wickedness be stronger upon you. Be stronger upon you. The appeal is being made. Isaiah 28 ends by saying, For the fishes are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fishes are beaten out with a staff, and the cumin with a rod. Bread corn is bruised, because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. In other words, friends, God allows the beating and bruising to happen, for affliction works for us. Suffering humbles us. Tragedy gets our minds in the right place. You see, friends, corn has to be bruised threshed, beaten, so that it can become corn flour and bread can be made from it. If the corn is not bruised, the flour cannot be produced. 
We won't get flour. We won't have that bread. The beating, the threshing, the tragedies of life. In this affliction, turn to the Lord and allow the great trials of life to teach us the precious lessons that show us how we are to hold on to a God for whom destruction is a strange thing to do. All of this is coming forth from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. He is wonderful in counsel. He is excellent in working. Is there somebody today who perhaps has seen God in a light you've never seen before? Is there someone today who's overwhelmed by the mercies of the Lord? Who stands on your pathway to destruction saying, child, don't be a mocker, lest the bands of this sin become stronger around you. Do not reject me. Turn to me and you shall be forever saved. There's so much, friends. There's so much that's ahead of us. There's so much God wants us to be ready for. God is saying he would not want anyone to be lost. In the book of Peter, we're told he wants that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. A strange act. A strange act he doesn't take joy in bringing about, for his desire is that all be saved with him in eternity. Is that you, dear friend? Is that your decision today? If it is, may you follow the appeal of the Lord, humble yourself before him, be a babe in his arms, and he will nurture you and nourish you in strength and righteousness. If that's you, dear friend, kneel with me as we pray and seek the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to hear your word. Oh, what a blessing it is. What a might it is to hear you appeal to your children. It's just beautiful, Lord, to hear you cry out to your people saying, come unto me and I will give you rest. Or perhaps there's someone who's downtrodden, feeling broken, lonely, destitute, hurt, wounded, weary, tired, barren, fruitless, someone who needs hope. I pray, God, that they may turn to the God who is merciful and true. I pray that your children will go over Isaiah 28 and see the God, the awesome God that he is, the sure foundation that he is, the attack upon falsehood that he is. I pray, dear God, that your people will look to you and live, for there's not a better way to live. Thank you for your assurances, your promises. Thank you, dear God, for the sure foundation of Jesus. And thank you for that promise that is firm, that if God has said it, he will do it. He's a man of his word. He who has promised is faithful. As we come to you, Lord God, take our hearts, mold us, shape us, Humble us that we would stay with you. Melt us. So that we can be put in the right mold and be made the people you always wanted us to be. Thank you for this awesome privilege. Let your name forever be praised. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.